But this morning, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 3, and I've titled today's message, Resting at His Feet. Resting at His Feet. Now, in this chapter, chapter 3, we're now going to shift this story to eventually its climax. You see that Naomi is no longer depressed, but hopeful. She's thinking of Ruth's future. So she begins to prepare her to seek the love of her willing family redeemer, Boaz. And so as we go through this chapter this morning, or as we begin this chapter, it's going to show us many things, but it's also going to show us that this, it's going to show us the steps that Ruth will be taking are the same steps God's people must take if we want to enter into a deeper relationship with the Lord. You see, church like Ruth, we mustn't be satisfied with just living on leftovers or even just receiving gifts. We must want him alone. For when we have him, we also have all that he owns. It's not the gifts that we seek. It's the giver. So we, before we begin reading, let's pray and ask once more and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Lord God, again, we come once again before you to, to ask you to speak powerfully now to all of us through your word through this story. Lord, we know that you have something in store for all of us, Lord. You want to tell all of us something as believers, as individually as believers and as a church, corporately, Lord. We know that you're, you have a message for all of us. So now I ask that uh, you soften our hearts so that we may receive it and hear it clearly. Remove all distractions, Lord, and that we now just rest at your feet as we continue with this story. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Ruth chapter... Three. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, and the word of God says, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Now isn't Boaz our relative? Have you been working with his female servants? This evening he will be winnowing barley in the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he is lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. So Ruth said to her, I will do everything you say. She went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had charged her to do. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, he went to lie down at the end of the pile of barley. And she came secretly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. At midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. So he asked, who are you? Chapter 2, as I said in the beginning, chapter 2 ended by telling us that while Ruth was uh, living with Naomi, she continued to gather grain alongside Boaz's female servants. Well, in this story, it seems that while Ruth was out working the field and Naomi there had time to put a plan together. And then she waited for the right opportunity to put that plan 
into motion. And so in these verses that we just read, we see that her plan, this plan that she had, was a plan of redemption. See, wisely realizing that Boaz may need some encouragement, she counseled Ruth about the best way, consistent with righteousness, of making known to Boaz her desire that he marry her. Now, keep in mind, because of of the transformation God had done in Naomi's heart, now we see that God was aligning the plan that Naomi had with his will. There's now something, there's an aligning, an alignment going on. Now, Boaz himself was, some say he was a widower himself, but more than likely, he just was an older guy that was just never married. It's possible that it's possible then that he may have been waiting, just waiting for the right woman, for the right girl to come along, a righteous woman in a time where, if you remember, it was just a really bad time. These were the time of the judges, and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. That's something I hopefully that you'll think about. Um, for those of you who are watching, those of you that are here, unmarried, young, that's one way you can stand out and be a part of the crowd is to be a good woman. Be a good woman with a good heart that is honorable, that is righteous. And the same applies for you men, you young men. Um, in a world where it's just a bunch of, you see it, the evil that's going on and just this obedience towards God, people raising their fists at God, that you just stand out from that crowd and be known as a righteous person, a righteous man or woman. And also, I'm sure that there were plenty of men there in that town in Bethlehem that would have been good Candidates that would have been just really good guys for Ruth to marry. Handsome, young, fit, maybe just had all the genetics, all the great things that a girl may be looking for in a, in a man, in a husband. But when it comes down to it, none of them were qualified. None of them had it. None of them could have redeemed Ruth. Only a family member could do that. And Boaz was that kinsman. Now, I am going to be using kinsman and family member interchangeably here, but if you hear me say that word kinsman, it's just the nearest, kinsman is just the nearest family member. Now, since Naomi knew that Boaz would be at the threshing floor, that night and staying there to guard his grain, she instructed Ruth to prepare herself to meet him. So Ruth made a fivefold preparation before she presented herself to Boaz. <coughs> First, verse 3 says that she washed herself. I'm not sure if you knew this, but every day in the United States, 450 billion gallons of water are used for homes. And I think in some homes it's much more than that, um, in some cities and places. And, but they're used in homes, factories, and farms. Enough water to cover Manhattan to a depth of 96 feet. In the east, and farms, and I'm sorry, in the east, the heat and the dust made frequent washing a necessity. But water wasn't always plentiful. With regard to the Jews, the law of Moses required ceremonial, ceremonial washings and taking a bath and changing clothes usually preceded a 
special event. So it's quite possible that really what Naomi was doing it was that she was telling Ruth to act like a bride preparing for her wedding. Church, if we want to enter deeper into a deeper relationship with our Lord, 2 Corinthians 7 1 says that we must cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Here's what I mean. Here's what I'm saying. When we sin, when you sin, we must pray, Lord, wash me. Lord, wash me. But here's the thing. Sometimes, and just sometimes, God says to us the words found in Isaiah 116, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves. 1 John 119 says that when we seek forgiveness, God washes the record clean. He wipes it out. You're now made washed. You're white as snow, a dirt of sin. He can no longer see the dirt of sin, the, the muck, the, the yuckiness of sin has been cleaned. <coughs> But God won't do, won't do for us what we must do for ourselves. Only we can put out of our lives those things that defile us. Only we can do, take out those things. We can purge them out. All those things that defile our hearts and our minds. I think we all know what they are. You all know what they are. Individual, we all have something, everybody. It may mean getting rid of those astrology books you have laying around the house or in your bookshelf. Or it may mean not watching a particular show or a particular musician, music, type of music you listen to. Perhaps it's deleting certain websites, not listening to certain podcasts, or even, again, unsubscribing from certain YouTube channels. The point is, is that we must separate. If you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself a Christian, you are born again, you must separate yourself from those things that defile your heart and mind. Back in the Old Testament, if priests came into God's presence defiled, they were in danger of facing death. They were in danger of really dying. At the time, the Jewish people they knew, they were aware of the importance of holiness because every time they came to worship, they were reverent, they took it seriously. Yet so many Christians today rush into God's presence without cleansing themselves of the sins that rob them of God's blessing. The reason many churches are dying today is often due to an empty worship routine. There is no deep worship. There is no heart of worship. There's no sincerity. The reason, again, people aren't seeing those blessings because they're not coming to God with a humble heart, with a broken heart and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. You've blessed me in so many ways and even though I've failed and I've fallen and I've messed up, thank you. Thank you so much. But he wants you to come to him 
for a spiritual cleansing. If you haven't done that, do it as soon as you can. And he will. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you no matter how bad you've blown it. Well, now in the second half of verse 3, we're told the next thing Ruth did to prepare. And that was to anoint herself. Eastern people used fragrant oils, perfume oils, to protect, their, protect and heal their bodies and to make themselves pleasant, smell good to others. A bride would especially take care to wear fragrant perfume that would make her nice to be near. Also, anointing oil speaks of the presence and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. According to 1 John chapter 2, all believers, all believers have been born again, have received the anointing of the Spirit. And therefore, we ought to be a fragrance of Christ to the Heavenly Father. See, the more we're like Jesus Christ in character and conduct, the more we please the Father. Now, I know we're not Jesus. We can't be Jesus, but we can be more like him. And the more we become more like him, the more the Lord smiles. The more the Lord says, that's my son, that's my daughter. pleases him to be more like Jesus Christ. And the more we please God, the more we please him, the more he can bless us and use us for his glory. A.W. Tozer said this, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of the world, much of what the church is doing would go right on and nobody would know the difference. See, friends, there's so many tools and resources available to the church. It's available to the church today that becomes more manageable, becomes easier to serve the Lord without the Holy Spirit working in our lives. But is that what God wants? Is that what God really wants? No. While here on earth, Jesus lived his life and did his work through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If the spotless Son of God needed the Spirit's power, how much more do we? Is it right to pray in the energy of the flesh when the Spirit is present to assist us? How much more fruitful would our witness for Christ be if just if we uh, just ask the Holy Spirit to help us? Can we fellowship with the Lord in His Word apart from the ministry of the Spirit of God? The answer to all these questions, all these questions is no. We as believers, as Christians, we need the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit at all times and in all places. Romans 8, chapter 14, I mean, Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 14 says, For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Be cleansed, be washed. Be anointed by the Spirit. Ruth's third act of preparation was to change clothes. She was, she was to put on the garments. She was to put off or take off the garments of a sorrowing widow and dress as if she was going to a wedding or be part of a wedding. Now, Ruth probably didn't have a large wardrobe. But she would always, everyone usually always had one special garment 
for festive occasions. Naomi had the faith to believe that Ruth indeed would soon be going to a wedding. Now in scripture, clothing carries a spiritual meaning. For example, after they had sinned against God, our first parents, Adam and Eve, tried to cover themselves, but only the Lord could forgive them and clothe them acceptably. And he had to shed blood to do it. The Jewish priests wore also special garments that nobody else was permitted to wear. Salvation, my friends, is also pictured as a change of clothes. And Christian living means taking off the grave clothes of the old life and putting on the grace clothes of the new life. It's taking off all that junk, all that stuff that only dead people wear. Now wearing on or putting on God's grace. We can't come to God's presence in our own righteousness. For, as it says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. We can only come in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For we are accepted in the beloved If we are obedient to his will and seek to please him, then our garments, our clothes will be white. But if we've sinned, we must confess our sins and seek his cleansing. And so if you want to enter into a deeper fellowship with the Lord, then let your garments always be white and let your head lack no, no oil. Okay, number four. Ruth prepared herself to meet Boaz by learning how to present herself to him. There was nothing improper about this procedure, for it was the only way that Ruth could offer herself to her kinsman redeemer, to her family redeemer. She had to put herself at the feet of the Lord of the harvest. And he'd do the rest. Now suppose, suppose that on her way to the threshing floor, Ruth decided to take a different approach. Why lie at the feet of a man you want to marry? But why uncover his feet? Then ask him to put a corner of his shawl, of his mantle, over you. Certainly they've got to, there's got to be a better way Had she used another approach, Boaz would have been confused. And the entire plan, the entire this entire thing that they were trying to do would have failed. The Old Testament priests knew how to approach God because he gave them their instructions in the law. New Testament Christians know how to approach God because the word has told us what is required, whether in our private communion with the Lord or in public worship, we have no right to alter the principles of of an approach that God has laid down. You just can't change it on your own. You just can't change it to fit your needs. No, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he breathe his last, that veil was torn in half. And that represented now that we can come into the Holy of Holies freely. You can go into the Holy of Holies and fellowship with God. You can't just change that. Like the prodigal son, lost sinners can come to the Lord just as they are, and he will receive them and change them. But God's own children must conform to the rules if 
they want to fellowship with their father. Now, if it sounds confusing, I can get with you later on about that. But, again, there are certain rules that we must, as believers, conform to. When the people of God assemble for worship, we must be careful to worship Him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Following the principles given in Scripture. When it comes to worshiping God, too often people do that which is right in their own eyes and substitute human inventions for divine instructions. Again, they try to do it their own way. And maybe you've been to some churches where it's been like that. Where they try to substitute what God has already ordained, what he said, and try to make it something completely different. Try to do what is right for them. Oh, this feels right. Let's just do this. No. We must follow what God has said about worship. Okay, so finally, Ruth promised to obey there in verse 5. All, Boaz said this, All that you say to me, I will do. Oh, the, I'm sorry, Ruth said that. She wasn't only a hearer of the word, but she was a doer. A willingness to obey the Lord is the secret of knowing what he wants us to do and being blessed when we do it. John 7, the little translation of John 7:17 7, is this. If anyone is willing to do God's will, he shall know concerning the teaching See, the will of God is not a cafeteria or a buffet where you can pick and choose what you want. God expects us to accept all that he has plans, plans for us, all that he has planned for us, and to obey him completely, coming to God with a hidden agenda and with reservations in our hearts, will only lead to grieving the Spirit and missing God's best. Again, maybe that's some of you. You're like, Lord, I, I, why, am not get, why am I not getting these blessings? How are you coming to Him? Ask us, begin there. He wants to bless you, but there's something going on. And again, only you know what that is. There's something going on in your heart that is keeping that, that bond from getting tighter. Come to him. Seek him. Confess those sins. Get rid of those things that are getting in the way. It may hurt for a while, but you know what? After that pain is gone, <coughs> after those feelings of uh, those feelings that you get when you're attached to something too much, um, after they go away, you're gonna start to really feel how close you are becoming to the Lord. You start seeing those blessings, and you're gonna start becoming more abundant. So don't come to him. Don't come to the Lord with a hidden agenda or with reservation. All right. Let's continue reading the next part of our passage this morning. If you still have your Bibles open, or if not, I'm in Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. And I'm going to pick up in verse 9. Luke chapter 3, verse 9. Well, let me back up a bit. One verse. 
Verse 8, at midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. So he asked, who are you? I am Ruth, your servant, she replied. Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. And he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown more kindness now than before because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Now don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all the people in my town know you are a woman of noble character. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer, but there is a redeemer closer. There is a redeemer closer than I am. Stay here tonight and in the morning. If he wants to redeem you, that's good. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will. Now lie down until morning. The harvest season was an an especially joyful time for the Jews, which is the way God wanted it to be. Back in Deuteronomy chapter uh, chapter 16, verse 15, it said, The Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, and you will have abundant joy. Have you guys ever really thought about when you guys are eating your family dinner, eating wherever it is that you're eating at, whether it's, you know, your favorite buffet place or whether it is at home, you guys have really thought about everything that's involved in producing and farming that food that you're eating, those vegetables and the meat, the, the cattle, all that's involved in all that. I don't think a lot of people do. I don't think a, a lot of people have any idea all that's involved in producing the food that they're eating. I think that a lot of people just take it for granted. So perhaps, just maybe, <coughs> our table prayers, when you are praying for your meal, I think that would be more joyful and more grateful if you realized, or if we all realized, that a farmer or a producer, everything that a farmer or producer goes through, to help keep us alive. God has used them to farm this food, feed this cattle, take care of this cattle. It's all for us to help keep us alive. Imagine if there were no farmers, there were no ranchers. I I don't think many of us have skills in knowing how to farm. We've probably seen videos on YouTube or if you have an idea, but it's much more than just planting a seed on the ground. It's much more than that. Well, anyways, again, maybe we'd be a lot more grateful if we pray for them. Anyways, harvesting and threshing were cooperative enterprises. The men of a village would take turns using the threshing floor, which is usually a raised platform outside the village and often on a hill where it could catch the evening breeze. The men would deposit the sheaves on the floor and then separate the grain from the stalks by having oxen walk on it by beating on the stalks. Once the grain was separated, the workers would throw the grain into the air and the breeze would carry the shaft away while the grain fell to the floor. The grain would then be heaped up to be carried away for marketing or storage. The men often worked in the evening when the breeze was up, and they slept at the threshing floor to protect the harvest. Now, let me also just point this out, that four times in this chapter, There is mention of feet. 
in verse 4, in verses 7 through 8, and uh, verse 14. In Ruth chapter 10, Ruth had fallen at the feet, I'm sorry, in chapter 2 verse 10, Ruth had fallen at the feet of Boaz in response to his gracious words. But now she was coming to his feet to propose marriage. She was asking him to obey the law of the kinsman, redeemer, and take her as his wife. Again, we probably asking ourselves, why didn't Ruth wait for Boaz to propose to her? Well, his statement in verse 10 suggests the verse reason. He fully expected that she wouldn't marry, that she would only marry, she probably would only marry one of the younger bachelors in Bethlehem. Boaz was an older man, and Ruth was a younger woman. So for him, you probably just thought, nah, I, I'm not going to have a chance with her. She's too young for me, or she's looking for a younger man. But the most important reason is given in verse 12. There was a nearer family member in town who had the first option on Ruth and the property. And Boaz was just waiting for him to act. Ruth had forced the issue, and now Boaz could approach his kinsman, that family member, and get him to decide. My friends, life is full of rude awakenings. A famous cartoon canine likes to say, that's what a famous cartoon canine likes to say, and more than one biblical character would agree. Adam went to sleep and woke up to discover he'd been through surgery and was now a married man. Jacob woke up to discover that he was married to the wrong woman. Boaz woke up at midnight to find a woman laying at his feet. I always wake up trying to figure out how this beautiful woman get in my, get in my bed. <laughs> but yes, life is full of rude awakenings. When he was asked, when uh, he asked who she was, Ruth replied that she was Ruth. But she didn't call herself, as she did the first time, the Moabitess. Now she was the servant of Boaz. She was making now a new beginning. Now this is interesting here because if you, you find Ruth named 12 times in this little book, and in five of these references, she's identified as a Moab or with Moab. Her next statement is telling as well. See, by saying, take me under your wing, meant that she, anybody saying that it was a claim for that person, it, it meant to claim that person for yourself, particularly in marriage. Even to the present day, when a Jew marries a woman, he throws the skirt or the end of his talith over her to signify that he's taken her under his protection. Back in chapter 2, verse 12, we saw that Ruth had come under the wings of Jehovah God. Well, now she would be under the wings of Boaz, her beloved husband. What a beautiful picture of marriage. Ladies, again, unmarried, watching, listening. Whoever that guy is that asks you to marry, marry you, to marry him, whoever that guy is, make sure that he can protect you. Make sure that he can provide for you. 
if he doesn't have the intense, intense, intestinal, I can't say it now, intestinal, yes, the guts, <laughs> all right, <laughs> intestinal, I can't say it right now, I used to always say, the, the guts to protect you, it's too scared, in my eyes, I don't know, there's something really wrong with him. I'm not saying that he had to f always be fighting for you. And No. As a man, as a husband, it's our job to protect our wives, to make sure they feel safe. I hope and I pray that that's what I'm doing now. I do the two most precious things in my house right now are my two girls. I will do everything I can to protect them. Yes, anything. Lord gave me that calling. He gave me that responsibility to protect my family and to provide for them. And so again, young women, women that aren't married, make sure that that man do that for you, that you feel safe, that you're not scared of him, you're not in fear of him, that he's going to hurt you, but rather that he will protect you if someone tries to hurt you. Well, next, in verses 10 to 14, or 13, we see Boaz's response. And his responses show us how the Lord responds to us when we seek to have a deeper fellowship with him. Just as Boaz spoke to Ruth, so too God speaks to us from his word. Here, here are just a few ways. He accepts us. Boaz might have refused to have anything to do with Ruth but his love for her, but, but in his love for her, he accepted her. He even called her my daughter and pronounced a blessing on her. Our Heavenly Father and our Redeemer are seeking for a closer relationship with us. And we shouldn't be afraid to draw near and to share their love. If we could only realize, in even a small way, the great love our kinsman redeemer has for us, we would. We would forsake everything. We would forsake everything else and just enjoy his fellowship. Secondly, he assures us. In the midnight darkness, Ruth couldn't see the face of Boaz. <coughs> but she could hear his voice. And that voice spoke loving assurance to her. Fear not. Friends, our assurance is not in our feelings or our circumstances, but it's in his word. Let me repeat that. Your assurance is not in your feelings or your circumstances, but in his word. During the Boxer Rebellion, when the workers with the China Inland Mission were experiencing great suffering, the founder, James Hudson Taylor, then in his late 70s, said to some of his colleagues, I cannot read, I cannot think, I cannot even pray, but I can trust. Unquote. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Fear not is the word of assurance that the Lord gave to many of his servants, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and the nation of Israel, Joshua, King Jehoshaphat, the Jewish remnant returning to their land, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Daniel, Joseph, 
Zacchaeus, Zacharias, Mary, the shepherds, Paul, and the Apostle John. You, all of you and I, can say, say these, this along with those spiritual giants. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Not only did Boaz calm Ruth's fears, but he also made a promise to her concerning her future. In verse 11, he said, I will do for you whatever you say. Whatever God starts, whatever God starts, he finishes. And what he does, guess what? He does it well. It wasn't Ruth's obligation to do for herself what only Boaz could do. What seemed to Noemi to be a simple procedure has now turned out to be a bit more complicated because there was a man in Bethlehem who was now a near kinsman. Boaz didn't withhold this problem from Ruth for he didn't want her to return home with a false hope in her heart. Joy and peace that are based on the ignorance of the facts, of the true facts, are but delusions that lead to disappointment. Again, I'd like to repeat that. Joy and peace that are based on ignorance of the true facts are but delusions that lead to disappointments. The great concern, what Boaz was really concerned about was the redemption of Ruth. Even if another kinsman redeemer had to do it. When you see this as a picture of our redemption in Jesus Christ, it impresses you. It impresses you strongly that God obeyed his own law when he ac accomplished our salvation in Christ. His law said in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, the soul who sins shall die. And God didn't seek some way to evade this. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, he didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Now, of course, there was no other kinsman who could redeem a lost world. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. No name, no other name other than Jesus. I want to close now by asking some of you, again, reaching out to those listening and watching this message. Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus? He wants to redeem you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to break the chains of sin and death that are got you all trapped. He wants to free you. And all you have to do is come to him. Make him the Lord of your life. Open your heart to him. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. If you're looking for redemption, if you're looking for salvation, the only place you can find it is in Jesus. He died for you. Holy, sinless man. Didn't do anything wrong. Share the truth. Share the love of God. Share the forgiveness. He didn't do anything. And yet, they put him to death. We put him to death. Because of our sin. 
We're the ones who deserved it. But now, because of his death, his righteousness, his holiness can be placed on us. And that's how God sees us, white as snow. And so, if you're ready now, today, to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. Seriously, I want you to do this with all, with all sincerity. If you're watching this and you're half hungover because of what you did on a Saturday night, just wait, rewatch this later on when you're completely sober. Pray. He wants you to come to him with a broken and sincere heart. And if that's you, and pray this. <coughs> Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and then rose again from the dead. And now repent. I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And so now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Anoint me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. I pray this in your name. Amen. You pray that you've been redeemed. If you sincerely really pray that you've been redeemed, the shackles of sin and death have been broken. One day we'll all be celebrating now together in heaven. If you need some help in your next steps of your new Christian walk, come talk to me or reach out to me. I want to help you. I can help you um, maybe find a church in your area if you need a Bible, we can send one to you. Or if you just need prayer, we can do that for you too. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. I hope you're blessed this week. Be a blessing unto others. Um, and look forward to seeing you again. For now, goodbye. We love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.